Hello, this is the Good Mood Podcast, and I am Dr. Talia Marcajani. In this episode, we're going to talk about activating energy and how and the connection between iron, copper, and magnesium. This episode is based on the book Cure, and uh, Cure is a play on the on the uh, anatomical symbol for copper. The book is called Cure Your Fatigue by Morley Robbins. Morley Robbins is a researcher um, who speaks about the relationship between copper and iron. And his book uh, was circulating in my channels amongst the people that I follow on Instagram and some of my colleagues who were writing things about iron being toxic to the tissues and that copper is the key element in regulating energy. And so this, this statement that I was seeing was mind blowing to me because what I learned in naturopathic college about copper was that it was something that we could become toxic in that, that a toxicity of copper was called Wilson's disease, that people that did hair mineral analysis and analyzed heavy metals in their, in their body via the hair found high levels of, of copper very frequently. Uh, one thing I did know about copper though, was that if you supplemented with zinc for long periods of time, you needed to add back in copper because high levels of zinc would eventually deplete copper. And that was about it. I never thought of it as something I would recommend as a supplement or something to be concerned about. I had no idea how copper might contribute to energy metabolism. What I knew about iron was that many people are deficient, that it was the number one nutrient deficiency on planet Earth, that many people were anemic and risk factors were vegetarianism, veganism, menstruation, and, and different types of chronic disease that resulted in iron loss in the body, like bleeding disorders and things like that, heavy menstrual periods. I knew that iron was important for thyroid function and for making dopamine, and that uh, it was one of the major things to look for if someone was experiencing fatigue. So when I started seeing all these conversations about iron, and I knew that iron was toxic, I knew that it was a, a bit of a Goldilocks nutrient and that too high levels could be toxic to the body and that too low levels were toxic and that the the ranges in conventional blood tests of the of the storage form of iron ferritin were way too wide and that we had a much more narrow sweet spot for getting someone's iron in an optimal zone and that the goal for ferritin was something between like 40 and 150 um whereas the the reference range is something like 5 to almost 300 so this is what I knew. So when I started to see these conversations happening about, you know, you should make sure someone's uh, serum ferritin is low, the cause of anemia is not low iron, that our foods are fortified with iron, I started to get curious. And so I, I grabbed a copy of Morley Robbins' book. And what I found was, so the, the book can be quite repetitive, um, but is very well researched. Molly Robbins, he, he's a researcher and sort of a lay person who dove into this topic to find the answer to why people are so fatigued. And the the book, you know, it's it, it's called the, the Cure or the Copper Cure, essentially, but it's so much more than that. He goes into the connections between magnesium, uh, how, what, what minerals and uh, nutrients are needed for the mitochondria, the power grids of the cells to work. He talks about, you know, our food supply and our soil quality and all of these rich topics and oxidative stress and mental and emotional stress. And so it's a very intriguing read and I wanted to package it into a shorter, uh, more concise format in my podcast because it has greatly influenced my practice. I already was starting to recommend beef liver, a whole food supplement for low iron and anemia in my patients. And I found that it was working much better despite beef liver actually having lower amounts of actual iron than iron supplements. Um, I was finding it was working much better in raising people's serum ferritin levels and it was improving their energy. Another thing I was noticing was that beef liver was improving people's neutrophil count when they had low neutrophils, a type of white blood cell. And I thought that neutrophil, low neutrophils were related to low zinc. And until I learned later that they are probably more related to low copper in the body. 
So I was recommending beef liver for, you know, low neutrophils, low, low iron and anemia and getting good results. And, and then I was, you know, on the liver bandwagon because liver is, you know, contains folate and choline and zinc and hyaluronic acid and retinol, preformed vitamin A. But like all things in our medicine, there's many levels of analysis with, with, with which you could work. And we know that we're on the right track, in my opinion, when these levels of analysis line up with one another. So for example, an ancestral practice or an evolutionary practice, such as consuming organs, nutrient dense foods may line up with a blood test that your, your iron is low. You start consuming beef liver and your iron levels go up and you feel better. This also may coincide with a deeper biochemical understanding of, of the, what we call the mechanism of action. So how these things play together at the body. And one thing I'm always continually impressed by is when I learn about mechanism of action, whether it's at the level of the genes or the biochemistry or the hormonal interactions in our bodies, we can always zoom out and re-examine the commonly prescribed practices in naturopathic medicine and make sure that those are lining up properly. So a good example is recommending sleep for people and, and sleep hygiene, and then understanding the circadian rhythms and clock genes and all of the hormones that are activated and influence our circadian rhythms. And then simple recommendations such as, you know, turn blue light off before you go to bed, eat breakfast in the morning, move your body during the day. These become more informed, complex, and nuanced and allow us to really get behind these recommendations and find different ways to explain why they are important to patients. So I'm always impressed, like often, you know, we end full circle back to what our our uh, naturopathic uh, predecessors uh, recommended, which is fresh air, sunlight, clean water, movement, these basic things like, you know, nutrient dense diet, beef liver included in that. And so we often come full circle, but, you know, just sort of like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, we sometimes have to go through a journey to get there to realize that, you know, we had the power to get back to Kansas all along. So I'm going to walk you through some of the notes I took on Morley Robbins book, and I'm going to try and tie it back to, um, you know, my naturopathic practice and, 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 and some of the understandings I have and how I may work with patients um, to give you a better understanding of how low energy and these three minerals, iron, copper and magnesium interplay with one another. You'll learn about the mitochondria, you'll learn about oxidative stress, and you'll learn about a key enzyme in detoxification that I didn't even know the name of, which is ceruloplasmin, which is a copper dependent enzyme in the body. Um, and then we'll come full circle to talk about why beef liver is, an, is an, a very important supplement that you might want to consider looking at, consuming or, or supplementing with. So when we talk about energy, you know, what I, what I have always known about energy when I was in naturopathic college, we learned that fatigue is the number one concern that patients seek naturopathic care for. And I also believe that fatigue is probably up there, uh, you know, as the main concern that people take to their medical doctor with. So we are all, you know, we fatigue, there's a, there's a, a an epidemic of fatigue in our society, but fatigue is not just the, you know, I mean, so good health is not just the absence of fatigue when we're talking about, and, and when, one thing I will always ask my patients, we always ask about energy. And in fact, I, I have them track their energy. When I see a new patient, they have, they track their energy and they, they write their daily energy on a scale of one to 10 every single day for a week in their lifestyle tracker that they get on the first visit. This is, so fatigue is a, an energy are very subjective measurements. I will, I will frequently see very anemic patients who say their energy is fine. It's like a seven out of 10. Most people say their energy is a seven out of 10. 
there's different types of energy. There's low motivation where we feel just blah, like it's, it's lower, almost cognitive energy. There's low physical energy where you feel like your body has worked hard. It's expended its physical resources. Maybe you feel muscle soreness and you feel physically tired. And then there's sleepiness, which is often what we think of when we think of low energy. So if I don't feel like my my eyes are dragging and getting heavy and my face is falling off and I don't feel that deep pull, that sleep hunger that we associate with sleepiness, then I often think like, oh, my energy is fine. But when I dig deeper and talk about energy with my patients, I find, you know, they're using coffee to keep themselves afloat. They're experiencing major drops in the afternoon. They're experiencing lower than normal motivation. They're not as pepped up and excited to do things. Energy is is the component, in my opinion, of what we what we mean when we say good health, when we talk about health. If you Google healthy and you look at stock images, you're going to see pictures of people displaying visual signals, images of high energy. So people like peace signs on a mountaintop, people jumping, running, energetic. And energy is what distinguishes us from non-living beings. It's all about energy. It's all about metabolism in order to maintain homeostasis and to make things happen in the body. Energy is more than just wakefulness or sleepiness. It's how quickly our metabolism and how efficiently they run, how we build and repair things in the body, how we destroy uh, bad cells and old cells in the body in order to rebuild new cells. It's how efficient our digestive system is, how we incorporate new nutrients, how our immune systems work, how our hair, skin, and nails grow and repair, wound healing. It's cognitive function. Energy is all is is the core of mental health. Even a very active brain, a brain that feels like it's on a hamster wheel and ruminating and and having a rapid thoughts and in having difficulty concentrating, almost like a manic brain, maybe a brain, a prefrontal cortex, particularly that lacks energy to shut off all of that noise in order to focus and concentrate on the here and now or whatever task you want to attend to. It's all about energy. So I hope this podcast is is getting you excited to learn more because energy is, I think, the key to good health. We can, you know, in any in any patient who's experiencing any sort of inflammatory condition, chronic fatigue, chronic pain, digestive issues, mental health issues, hormonal issues. If we all roads lead back to energy pathways and metabolism in the body, that ultimately is the is the starting point for being a living being and and the and often where things have started to go wrong that have led to the symptoms that we're experiencing today. So how, what is energy? Energy, we make energy in our body through a process called cellular respiration. And very simply, you take in oxygen and you exhale CO2, right? We know this. You can't live without oxygen. We're really going to get into this in this podcast. It's going to be a little bit technical, but I hope I'll, I'll zoom out enough to make it relatable and to weave a narrative. Now, in order to to make this process happen, one of the things that we are doing is breaking down glucose, i.e. sugar, and lipids, i.e. fat, from the food we eat. So oxygen, we take in, we take in glucose or fat, and we transform those ingredients into carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Energy in our body is called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's like the currency, the money of the cell. Very interestingly, we produce our body weight in ATP every day. It's a lot of energy. So during this process, and you might remember this from grade six, grade seven science class, you rearrange atoms within molecules, but nothing new is created and nothing is destroyed. This is the law of conservation of energy in physics, if you care to know, by a man called Emile de Châtelet. This is called aerobic respiration, and it's the most efficient way to get energy, and it requires the presence of oxygen. 
plants, animals, and humans all use aerobic cellular respiration. The difference with plants, though, is that they get their molecules from photosynthesis, and humans and animals, we obtain our molecules from food. So, you know, I don't know if you remember this from high school, uh, but, you know, you have, you take glucose and it goes through this process called glycolysis, breaks down into something called pyruvate. And the pyruvate goes through the Krebs cycle, or the TCA cycle is another name for it. And the TCA cycle is this kind of closed loop where different things are converted and things pop out, mainly electrons and a little bit of ATP. These electrons then go through the electron transport chain. And in this electron transport chain, the electrons interact with oxygen through these different protein complexes at the mitochondrial membrane. <laughs> Does any of this ring a bell? And we start to create water and ATP as we run this process. So it's like a motor that's pumping out energy as we use high energy oxygen atoms. We harness their energy through these series of very controlled steps in our body, and we make ATP. And the, the gear, the motor that makes an ATP is an enzyme called ATP synthase, which amazingly, it's like a little motor and it spins 9,000 RPMs. So that's repetitions per minute. What's a car? Is it 3,000 or something? And it produces three ATP with each rotation. This step requires the presence of magnesium and copper, and we will visit that in this podcast, but I just want to preface that. One of the things about Morley Robbins' book is that there's a there's a lot of moving pieces. So I tried to organize it in a, in a bit of more of a linear fashion, but there's going to be a lot of like, we'll come back to this. So bear with me. So this is the process of energy. Very simple, right? So we take glucose, we take oxygen and, and fat. So either glucose or fat. We run glucose through the glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and then the electron tra transport chain, and we make ATP. In order to be healthy our, and energetic, our cells, the basic unit of life in our bodies, they need to be able to create energy and clear exhaust. So when we make ATP, when we're spinning this motor and harnessing the power of oxygen, it's not a clean reaction. Just like your car makes exhaust in order to, to produce energy to make the car go, the car go, not cargo, <laughs> we produce exhaust in our cells. So in our mitochondria, they make 90% of the energy in the body, but also produce 90% of the exhaust. We need to find a way to neutralize that exhaust because our cells are a closed system, we have to be able to get rid of that exhaust, bind it up to clear it properly from our body. Otherwise, it's going to start to cause problems. It's like running your car inside a closed garage. It's not a good idea. So if our mitochondria are not properly structured and if electrons are not properly th flowing through them, if all of those proteins that I alluded to in the mitochondrial membrane are not working properly then they're not going to properly activate the oxygen cleanly and completely and we'll get more exhaust building up and this is going to this is part so both the failure to produce energy efficiently and the buildup of exhaust is going to contribute to fatigue chronic inflammation and disease and this is called mitochondrial dysfunction at its very core and we're going to visit this in more detail so here's, I'm, I'm not going to go maybe too much into these details, but the mitochondrial matrix contains copper, which I did not know. And copper is one of the key elements that enables the mitochondria to create energy from oxygen and iron, which we'll talk about cleanly. So there's five complexes that are part of the electron transport chain, complex one to five five being ATP synthase and complex four and five, they're both com copper dependent. When there's no copper available for copper deficient, then the entire mitochondria just shuts down. So in other words, if, if the mitochondria don't have enough copper, they can't function. We also need, um, so 
complex one, the first of those five complexes, its job is to um, it's to create is to change NAD to NADH. Now, if you're interested in sort of like anti aging and um, and you know and and, and supplements like nicotinamide. Um, riboside like so there's a lot of research on nad and aging and because one of the things that nad does is trigger apoptosis which is killing old and damaged cells so this is, this is a very powerful mechanism for anti-aging it's like when we clear up old cellular debris and junk and this prevents cancer and complex one so complex one is important for this step and complex one to five they all contain heme protein we need bioavailable copper to make sure that these heme proteins and these complexes are working. Now, it's also important to note that the mitochondrial matrix or the 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 bilipid membrane, so there's there's the mitochondria are these little power grids in our cells. And there, that's where they make the energy, but also the exhaust for our body. One of the, they they contain this sort of like fatty layer. So mitochondria used to be, they think, bacteria. That they were these other organisms that existed independently of us and somehow got incorporated into our cells and became part of our cellular machinery. And um, they help us make energy. So they, it's almost like they're a cell within within our cells, a cell within a cell. They even have their own DNA. Mitochondria, the in their lipid bilayer, so in their membrane. So around our cells, we have a lipid membrane it's made of fats, and one side of it is um, likes water, and one side of it likes fat, and it sort of keeps all the cellular components inside. So in the mitochondria, there's a lipid called cardiolipin, which is the most important, well, it, it makes up 20% of the mitochondrial bilipid membrane. This gets damaged by consuming seed oils, FYI. So high linoleic acid, one of the, um, one of the hypotheses is that cardiolipin is damaged by uh, high omega-6 fats. So seed oils like canola oil, corn oil, vegetable oil, all the oils that I always talk about on in Instagram of being terrible for your health. Now, we need a copper-dependent enzyme to help keep that lipid bilayer, keep uh, cardiolipin healthy. There's one of those complexes in the mitochondrial mem membrane that forms the electron transport chain is complex four. So complex four and complex five are copper-dependent. Co complex five is ATP synthase. That's that motor that makes ATP. And complex four, another name for it is cytochrome C oxidase, which is a, um, a copper dependent enzyme. So that means it needs copper to function. And remember, if it doesn't have copper, the whole mitochondria shuts down. So it prevents cardiolipin from oxidizing, from, be, from you know, becoming damaged. And, um, and it helps to make sure that the right type of iron is incorporated in that cell membrane. Our mitochondria, there's 40 quadrillion, those 15 zeros, mitochondria that populate each and every human body. Again, they're 90%, they create 90% of our energy, but also 90% of the exhaust or waste in our cells. Now this exhaust or waste, other names for it are free radicals, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. So ROS or RNS. You probably heard of the term antioxidant. So an antioxidant is something that prevents oxidation or oxygen related damage to our cells and our bodies. So remember that oxidation. Oxidation is the process of oxygen, which is a very reactive molecule, damaging our cells. Now, this process in the mitochondria of creating energy and clearing exhaust relies on magnesium, copper, and iron, along with a enzyme called ceruloplasmin.
Mitochondria you can think of as the energy factories or powerhouses or power grids because they all kind of work together within a cell. They divide and they bond together. They own their own set of DNA, which is very similar to bacterial DNA. And interestingly, if you want to know this, if you want to nerd out on this, is all mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother. So you get all of it. You inherit all of it from your the maternal genetics. The only cells in the body that don't have mitochondria are red blood cells, but all other cells, so they, they are anaerobic. All of our other cells are aerobic, meaning, meaning they need oxygen to create energy, and the oxygen is created into energy within these mitochondria. And there's this sort of interdependent relationship between us and our mitochondria. We depend on them to make energy and they depend on us to run around the world and find, find food to fuel them. So 40% of our heart cell is made up of mitochondria in the cytoplasm. And that's 10,000 mitochondria in each muscle heart muscle cell. The liver is 20 to 25% mitochondria. Cytoplasm is just really like the inside of the cell. So 40% of the heart cell is mitochondria floating around. 20 to 25% of the liver cell is taken up by the mitochondria, about 2,000 mitochondria per cell. And our brain cells contain about 2 million mitochondria per neuron. So our heart, our liver, and our brain are very energy-hungry cells. They rely on tons of energy, but then they also produce tons of exhaust. This is why a lot of mitochondrial supplements or things that support mitochondria are really important for mental health, liver health, aka detoxification, hormone production, glucose metabolism, and heart health, cardiovascular health. So things like CoQ10, they support the mitochondria. They also support our brain, our liver, our heart, and our gametes, our reproductive cells like the ovaries and the, and the testes. Mitochondria initiate apoptosis to destroy aging cells, and this prevents them from becoming cancerous. They play a role in determining which egg or ovum is released during ovulation, and they screen for biocompatibility, you know, making sure that the egg has the right type of DNA to go on to make a baby. Each egg cell has 600,000 mitochondria, which is why mitochondrial support is so important for fertility and things that help cognitive function often help fertility, often help liver function, often help cardiovascular function. There's a lot of overlap in these types of supplements. Sometimes why I'll recommend like a, like a cognitive supplement for fertility to a lot of patients. Calcium, which is a, you know, a, a nutrient that's important for many bodily functions, including heart and muscle function and vital for a number of cellular processes. It, it helps cell communication. It, it, the mitochondria prevent it from building up in the cells. They guide the process of uh, preventing calcium buildup by absorbing calcium ions and storing them when needed. Mitochondria help us generate heat. They burn brown fat so it's fat that has a lot of mitochondria, and this is burnt through shivering. Impaired mitochondrial function is creates energy deficiency, and this also triggers oxidative stress. Oxidative stress uh, precedes, according to a man called Dr. Wallace, it precedes symptoms of not all, or not some, but all chronic conditions. So at the core... Mitochondrial dysfunction or impaired mitochondrial function that causes energy deficiency and oxidative stress on the body. So the an issue with creating energy and an issue with clearing exhaust is the root of all chronic conditions in some way or form. So Mitochondria are supposed to be clearing this exhaust, but their DNA are also more susceptible to free radical and reactive oxygen species damage than human DNA. And so when mitochondria are not functioning properly, they create more reactive oxygen species, which 
causes them to be further damaged and not function properly. So it becomes a vicious cycle. And one of the things that I see in my practice, you know, I believe that our bodies are very intelligent and that we're always striving for healing and homeostasis and where we require the intervention of a naturopathic doctor or somebody to come in is when our body has trouble writing itself, restoring that homeostatic ba balance because we're caught in a vicious cycle such as this, right? So mitochondrial damage, there's an issue with removing oxidative stress out of the mitochondria, with, which causes further mitochondrial damage, which causes further issues with removing that exhaust, which causes further damage, and so on and so on, until there's a major issue and the body can't fix it. And then we have to step in and support mitochondrial health. We'll talk about some of the roots of why the mitochondria may not be functioning properly in this podcast. So we see the results of this mitochondrial damage in diseases, like through diseases that are related to areas of the body that have the highest energy demand. So this includes our heart, as we mentioned, the brain, central nervous system, muscles, liver, kidneys, GI tract, and eyes. When the mitochondria stop functioning, cells that are that they're in become energy starved and notice an increase in oxidative stress. So the oxygen that is supposed to be getting activated cleanly and completely by complex four or cytochrome C oxidase, which is copper dependent to make water and release ATP or oxygen, it starts to become rusty. It starts to become oxidized and damaged. And then it, it is no longer able to make energy properly and we get more reactive oxygen waste. And so the conditions that are associated with this are cognitive issues like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and other conditions of the brain, central nervous system, mental health conditions. Bipolar disorder is considered to be associated with mitochondrial functioning. And it's one of the reasons why lithium may be a helpful treatment or why it's a conventional treatment. We find that with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other cognitive and degenerative uh, brain disorders, that there's a higher number of da damaged mitochondria compared to healthy people in people with these conditions. Damaged mitochondria contribute to premature aging. And in order to protect them, and we're going to revisit this, we need two essential nutrients for producing energy, copper and magnesium. And the copper is bound in an enzyme called ceruloplasmin. Iron is needed for this creation of energy, but it can muck up the production of energy if there's too much of it and it becomes unbound. And we'll visit this again. So let's talk about the, the, the elements. <laughs> so 2.4 billion years ago, oxygen was not really abundant on the planet. It started to increase... Uh, around 2.4 billion years ago in the uh, great oxyg oxidation event on Earth. So around that time, it was about 0.1% oxygen in the air. And most of the life on Earth was anaerobic and then it did not need oxygen. And then about, you know, two to two and a half billion years ago, we got this great influx of oxygen and now about 21% of our atmospheric air is oxygen. And interestingly, iron is the number one element on Earth. So 35% of the elements on Earth are iron. So remember that when we talk about iron deficiency. So oxygen and iron are both quite reactive. Iron is the master pro-oxidant element in that it reacts with oxygen very readily. And oxygen is the second most reactive element on planet Earth. The first is fluorine. Now, when oxygen and, and iron, they interact outside of our body, it's called rust, right? So your car, the iron in the metal of your car is exposed to oxygen and it becomes rusty. It creates rust inside the body when oxygen binds to iron it creates oxidative stress like and so you can think of it as like rusting the body but it, there's not actual rust forming in your body but there's this oxidative stress occurring oxygen bound to iron is unstable 
But there's a, another element, copper, that exists on our planet that um, it, it enabled aerobic life to form because in some way, which we'll talk about, copper allows our bodies to harness the energy of oxygen without creating any exhaust. So whereas iron can interact with oxygen, it creates a lot of, of oxidative stress, rust, damage, whereas copper can interact with oxygen in a clean fashion that doesn't damage the body. So in essence, energy is the activation, which we, we spoke about this, is the activation of hydrogen and oxygen to make water. The recycling of ADP into ATP inside the mitochondria or cells power grid and the dynamic interaction of iron, copper, magnesium, and ceruloplasm. The steps of making energy in our body are number one, hydrogen, hydrogen and oxygen combine to make water. Number two, water enables the release of copper-dependent ADP that gets transformed into ATP or magnesium ATP, which is a copper-dependent step. And then copper via the protein ceruloplasmin supports these processes and prevents iron from causing the oxidants thrown off by the process from rusting in the body's tissue and organ and creating oxidative stress. And this is the process of cellular respiration. So oxygen is magic because it takes glucose and fat from our food and it creates 20 to 70 times the ATV, ATP or energy production that anaerobic metabolism would create. So it 20 to 70 times the amount of energy we can make by adding oxygen to the equation. And this was so before oxygen appeared on the planet several billion years ago, we just didn't have this energy creating capacity. And so complex life such as human beings did not exist. And most of the life on earth was anaerobic, sim simple celled organisms. So oxygen is probably what makes life on earth possible. You know that you can't survive very long without oxygen. It's about seven minutes, eight minutes until you experience permanent brain damage if you, if you don't get enough oxygen. And, you know, but, but oxygen is extremely reactive. It's the second most reactive chemical on earth. So it, that, it means it has so much energy. So it needs to be harnessed properly by our bodies. Our body can't let uh, oxygen run run uh wild it has to be complexed in different proteins in the body and the energy has to be harnessed very carefully and then we have to dispose of the waste it's sort of like nuclear reactors like you get a lot of energy of nuclear reactions which is essentially what is happening in our cells but we have to be very careful that the waste that's produced is is enclosed and taken care of and kept away from our body so it can't um, create any damage so oxidative stress occurs in our mitochondria through the production of energy. It makes 90% of the energy in the body and 90% of the oxidative stress. As we age, this oxidative stress will begin to take place in our body. So, you know, as babies, we have very little amounts of uh, iron, we're going to get into, and then we start to add, and, and you know, so we don't have much that's going to interact with, with rogue oxygen in the body. But then after every day of our life, we add about a, one milligram of iron. And this iron mixes with oxygen and starts to create oxidative stress. And as a result, we start to notice fatigue as we age. And we associate with that with aging, but we don't actually know the mechanism, right? We don't we never realize, oh, it's it's oxidative stress and it's oxygen iron combining in our body, damaged mitochondria. So our health issues as we age become more noticeable and chronic and, and more chronic and noticeable. And the first sign is often a change in our eyesight. So fatigue, aches and pains, this is where things start to set, set in, you know, around age 40. But even with more modern times, we're starting to notice these things start to happen even earlier because of environmental and dietary factors and more buildup of iron, according to Morley Robbins, and more oxidative stress that's interacting with this iron. 
One of the things that gets added to our food supply are iron filings. So these are added to grains and cereals. And you can look up videos on YouTube where they blend cereal with water and then they use a magnet to pull the iron filings out of it. So not organic iron that our body recognizes, but iron filings, which are very highly absorbed. So we're adding loads and loads of iron to our bodies all the time. And then with every molecule of ATP we make, we're producing more reactive oxygen species, more oxidative stress. And then we're going to learn we are deficient in copper and we're starting to, and, and more and more iron starts to enter the body and becomes more prevalent. And now we experience this acceleration of aging because we can't soak up the oxidative stress with copper and we're getting more iron that's bound to that's bound to these reactive oxygen species that starts to create damage and stress in the body. This is called the free radical theory of aging developed by a man called Denham Harmon, PhD. So his theory is that when oxygen cannot be activated by copper in the mitochondria to make water and release magnesium ATP or ATP, it results in oxidative stress, production of free radicals and reactive oxygen species and oxidants. And this starts to create damage in our body, more fatigue, more chronic health conditions, and more rapid effects of aging, such as poor eyesight is the number one thing. We start to get uh, mitochondrial damage and oxidation of the lipids and the fatty membranes of the eyes. So iron, very important molecule in the body. 80% of iron is carrying oxygen. Um. 70% of the iron is in hemoglobin and 10% of the iron in our body is myoglobin. Iron's job is to carry oxygen around our body in the form of hemoglobin and myoglobin. It keeps oxygen bound up because oxygen really rapidly reacts with iron, but when it's complex in hemoglobin, it keeps it safe and it's in our blood, it, in the red blood cells, and it moves around the body to get sent to the mitochondria and then the copper directed kitchens of the mitochondria to help us create energy. So in 1941, iron filings were added to the food system via enriched wheat flour and grain-based products. This began in the US, Canada and Britain, and the goal was to protect against iron deficiency anemia. If you listen to my podcast, you hear that a lot of these like massive changes to our food supply, like the addition of seed oils to protect your health and adding folic acid to supplements and food, that these are usually disastrous. And I think it all comes from a place of biological reductionism where we focus on one specific thing. And if we get that answer wrong, we are screwed. If we zoom out, like I talked about before, and we analyze the situation from various layers, from an evolutionary layer, an ancestral epidemiological layer, a biochemical, hormonal layer, a nutritional layer, we start to get the right answer. When everything stacks up, kind of like a Rubik's cube or like one of those combo locks for your bike, I feel like we are more likely to get the answer right. When we reduce everything down to just one thing and we there's a loose association and then we do these large scale projects to try and, you know, maybe um, maybe we're benevolent, maybe we, we have good intentions, but we do these large scale pro projects. This is where disastrous things can occur and we sometimes don't see the effects until decades and decades later. And we very often don't understand that that's the issue because our bodies there's no, there's no real linear cause and effect relationship in our bodies, as we're going to learn, right? This, this buildup of iron that we're seeing does not necessarily get reflected in our blood. And it, it only really is a problem, or it's more significantly a problem when we're, we become deficient in other nutrients, because our bodies are complex, and they have a lot of adaptive mechanisms, they can, they can adapt, and they can, they can find another way so if there's toxicity or if there's deficiencies, our bodies have plan B and sometimes plan C and plan D. But when all of those plans fail is when we start to see problems. And then even then our body can still compensate and hang on until we end up with some sort of chronic disease that then gets chalked up to genetics or bad luck or what have you. So I'm very passionate about finding the root cause. Right? This is what naturopathic medicine is all about. It's how do we 
find the root of the problem or a root. You know, there is no one root cause very often, but what is what what is one of the roots that we could eradicate that we could that we could pull up like those blackhead commercials where there's like you know you're, you're, it's like th that are satisfying to watch when you like you get a strip and pull all the blackheads out of your pores like how can we eradicate the problem at its most basic conceptualized level so in 1969 the addition of iron filings increased by 50 percent based on fda recommendations so in 1941 we started introducing iron filings to food 1969, this increased by 50%. We wanted to protect against iron deficiency anemia, but we had no concept of how iron deficiency anemia came to be, and thus the solution was not the right one. So iron in our tissues can be 10 times the iron in the blood, and this is called the labile iron pool, and labile is another name for reactive. We have something called the reticuloendothelial system, the RES, that whose that's job is to recycle iron on a daily basis. We need copper to activate this, this RES, this reticuloendothelial system of iron recycling. So it pulls iron from the tissues, which 10, 10, 10 times of the, you know, of the iron can be in the tissues than the blood, and it puts it back into hemoglobin. So lack of copper can cause iron to become sequestered and stored in the tissues. Um or to recycle macrophages. And this dysfunction in the daily iron recycling program is theorized to be the metabolic origin for over 100 autoimmune conditions that have been escalating during the last 40 years. And this is based on the work of Nancy Andrews, MD, Rebecca Kinn, MD, and Marianne Wessling Resnick, PhD, that they're examining this this issue with iron metabolism and recycling that's contributing to autoimmune conditions. So they've connected it to SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. One of the, probably the mechanisms that causes IBS, leaky gut, this is where bacteria in the small intestine ferment our food, cause bloating, gas, bowel movement issues. So constipation, diarrhea, leaky gut, Crohn's colitis are all possibly caused by excessively high iron levels in the intestinal cells, according to these researchers and these women. So a, a buildup of iron in the enterocytes or the gut cells can disable proper mineral and energy metabolism. And iron that doesn't get absorbed or released into the blood festers in these tissues and causes oxidation in them and rusting and issues. And as I tell many of my patients that gut, our gut doesn't have a lot of pain receptors. So like you might feel a, a rash on your skin, you can't really feel damage in your gut until you start to get symptoms like bloating and diarrhea and motility issues. So constipation and nausea and gastritis, and you, you start to get these symptoms later on when things have already been bad. So we can't feel leaky gut very often. Signs of leaky gut could be like systemic issues. So like you feel inflamed or puffy or swollen, you have a headache. So it's something to keep in mind that are the root of these issues an, an overload of iron, an issue in our iron recycling system, causing ox, you know, contributing to oxidation and, you know, contributed to by the mitochondria that's also going to cause low energy and more oxidative stress and inflammation. So inert iron binds to oxygen to capture it and rust it. So iron is the, the um, element that is uh, the master oxidant. So it's the element that reacts most with oxygen. Iron bound to tissues and organs captures oxygen and it causes the tissues to oxidize or rust. It's really oxidized. Instead of being bound in the tissues, iron in the body is needed to needs to be mobilized and to circulate so it can carry oxygen to our organs, tissues, cells, and mitochondria to be turned into energy. That is iron's job. Iron is designed to deliver oxygen, but when it gets stuck in the tissues, health problems begin at the level of oxidative stress resulting from failed energy production and failed oxygen elimination. Iron is, as we talked about, is the pro-element, pro-oxidant element on planet Earth. It's the most abundant um, element on Earth. And it's the principal element behind oxidative stress. It's also associated with magnesium loss, which we'll talk about, which can create ch chronic inflammation. And there's this sort of chicken and egg relationship between magnesium deficiency, which we'll get into in oxidative stress. 
So there's a lot of mechanisms with iron triggering inflammation, such as IL-6, which is inflammatory cytokine, triggers C-reactive protein. Um, and it triggers a hormone called hepcidin, which is the hormone of inflammation. And we need an enzyme called um, ferroxidase because iron exists as ferrous, so Fe2+, and ferric, Fe3+. These uh, these oxygens, they have unpaired electrons and the class they share electrons. They bind with oxygen and, and you know, even iron change because of how it re reacts to oxygen. It's used to carry oxygen and hemoglobin. So for every odd atom of, uh, for every 60 atoms of iron, there's an atom of copper though that helps iron uh and oxygen interact properly. So copper is sort of carrying the shots when it comes to iron and oxygen. So iron's job is to carry the oxygen around in the body, but copper makes sure that it does it properly. Because dysregulated, unbound, and excess iron is the greatest source of oxidative stress and inflammation in the body. And while iron is vitally important to our health, when it becomes unbound and ends up where it does not belong, then problems arise. Iron's main job is to produce hemoglobin to maintain immune function, ensure muscle function and, con and, and contraction, improve endurance, improve lung health, proper respiration, repair damaged tissues and organs. It's a component of other proteins and enzymes. It's very important for dopamine production. So like motivation, mood, um, focus, concentration, excitement. It's important for thyroid production. I frequently see low iron and uh, and dysfunctional TSH, so high TSH, high, uh, hypothyroidism. It's important for collagen synthesis and for the production of other neurotransmitters. But for iron to be functional, we need adequate levels of copper that are bioavailable. Hemoglobin is made up of four heme groups and our body cannot make heme or knit them together without copper. We also need to insert an iron into each of the heme groups to bind with oxygen. And this doesn't work without bioavailable copper. 90%, 95% of the iron that we need comes from the, the reticuloendothelial system, so the daily iron recycling system. And essential to this system is copper. Without it, copper or iron builds up inside the mitochondria and it chokes off the mitochondria's ability to breathe and to make magnesium ATP. And when iron is low, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, Morley Robbins wants practitioners to immediately question the status of iron in the tissue, iron part of the iron recycling system. Because iron in the tissue, as we talked about, can be 10 times what they are in the blood. Stress hormones can cause iron to be liberated from their from its storage proteins and create immune, uh, immune release. Iron can contribute to bacterial growth, stress hormone release, and infections. And it can also weaken our immune defenses if we have too much iron. So copper, copper's job is to activate oxygen and create water and release that energy and then deactivate the oxidants to clear metabolic exhaust. So copper exists in the cytochrome C oxidase or complex four of the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. So what it's doing is absorbing oxygen and then in the next step, complex five, it's making ATP. So this step of grabbing oxygen and making energy and water is copper dependent. And like we talked about, those two steps, if they don't work properly, the entire mitochondria shuts down and stops energy production. Copper has the unique ability to turn a molecule of oxygen into two molecules of water without producing oxidative stress. Therefore, we need bioavailable copper to prevent oxidative stress. Copper keeps oxygen in the body from rusting or creating stress or damage to our cells, tissues, and organs. And it regulates iron status, preventing its reaction with oxygen and, uh, and, and, and preventing oxidative stress. 
Copper also runs a series of enzymes, one of them called ceruloplasmin, which is designed to absorb oxidative stress that may be produced um, by the activation of oxygen. Copper is a trace mineral. It's essential. It's not made by the body. And so we need to get it from food or from the environment. And it's an important element. And again, like I said, I never thought of it as something essential. I thought that we were, if anything, like copper toxic. But without bioavailable copper, your body can't produce all the energy it needs and you can't stay healthy. Our liver is responsible for carrying out 500 vital functions of the body, and they all require copper and copper-dependent enzymes. This is why the liver is such a rich source of copper. Beef liver is a rich source of copper, uh, spoiler alert, um, because there's so many copper-dependent enzymes in the liver, which is responsible for detoxifying our organs, for processing toxins in the body, for metabolizing medications and environmental toxins. Copper protects the thyroid gland and other tissues from oxidative stress. And copper deficiency can result in thyroiditis. Glutathione, which is our body's master antioxidant, this is what soaks up oxidative stress, it requires copper. Superoxide dismutase, or SOD, is an antioxidant enzyme, um, and it regulates antioxidant cleanup during the production of thyroid hormones. It requires copper. Our immune system, our first line of defense against infection, it requires copper and hematopoiesis, the formation of heme and blood cells, including red blood cells, requires copper. In fact, copper is responsible for creating bone. It's important for bone turnover and bone formation. Red blood cells, um, they are, you know, their creation is, is required by, requires copper and therefore and, you know, especially in the bone marrow. And so lack of bioavailable copper, which we're going to learn may be the cause of anemia, but, and it also may be the cause of unhealthy red blood cells contributing to anemia. Like I mentioned, neutrophils, which are the, a primary type of white blood cells, they're involved in our innate immune response. So it's the first line defense against infection. They destroy harmful bacteria and viruses in the blood, they can't perform their important tasks without copper because copper deficiency causes them to weaken as they attempt to uh, attack and destroy microorganisms. So I noticed that copper deficiency can reduce the number of neutrophils causing something called neutropenia. And it's possibly because of the role of ATP that's produced from copper dependent enzymes. And what I've seen is that in raising, you know, supporting someone's copper status, that their neutrophils increase. Bone, collagen, connective tissue, and prevention of certain genetic disorders depend on copper. And one of the things that many scientists have known, which, you know, it somehow doesn't make its way into the medical literature and common like clinician knowledge, is that copper deficiency increases oxidative stress in the body. Copper deficiency causes the rise of oxidative stress that's met with the increase in cholesterol production in the body, which we'll talk about. So high cholesterol can equal oxidative stress and low copper. Ceruloplasmin is a copper-dependent enzyme that's involved in reducing oxidative stress in our body. It's the sun of our bodily universe of metabolic activity. And this is an enzyme I had never heard of before. It expresses up to 20 or more enzymatic functions produced in our livers, eyes, brains, kidneys, gonads, uterus, placenta. So we need to be able, our cells need to be able to clear the exhaust as energy is produced by our mitochondrial power grid. Oxidants are given off as byproducts of the process of making magnesium ATP and ceruloplasmin, along with other copper-dependent antioxidant enzymes, keeps it in check and they prevent oxidative stress. That's the root cause, as we discovered, of chronic conditions. Ceruloplasmin also makes copper available to our cells, tissues, and organs. So it's, it's sort of the hemoglobin for copper. So hemoglobin binds iron and carries it around. Ceruloplasmin is what makes copper bioavailable. It's the taxi that drives copper where it needs to go to the mitochondria so that, my, that it can be involved in complex four and five and making ATP and cleanly. 
Ceruloplasmin belongs to a family of proteins uh, known as multi-copper oxidases. They regulate the transportation of iron into red blood cells and other iron-containing proteins involved in cell growth. Ceruloplasmin carries six to eight copper atoms in each molecule. And it, it again, it's involved in iron metabolism. And it prevents oxidative stress and inflammation from unbound iron and oxygen. What it does is scavenge and inhibit the production of hydroxyl radicals, superoxide radicals, lipid peroxides. So these are all like reactive components in our body that might snag DNA or cell membranes and create inflammation and damage to our tissues. Ceruloplasmin is sort of like the street sweeper that goes around and sucks everything up and neutralizes it all. So it regulates iron, copper, and oxygen status in the body. And if energy is falling and oxidative stress is rising, it's very likely, according to Morley Robbins, that our body lacks bioavailable copper or ceruloplasmin. So they think that, you know, according to him and the research he's done is copper is the, is the key ingredient for regulating cellular energy. One of the enzymes in ceruloplasmin is ferroxidase. So it's an enzyme that catalyzes iron to make sure that iron is not reactive. So it turns iron from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, the ferric to the ferrous form. Defects or unhealthy mutations in ceruloplasmin gene prevent copper from being incorporated into ceruloplasmin, which disrupts iron metabolism and leads to iron accumulation. And defective ceruloplasmin lacking copper is a factor in a wide range of diseases, uh, such as walking gait abnormalities, impaired memory, speech problems, and other symptoms. And I wonder if there's an issue in ceruloplasmin, and we're going to find out later, vitamin A deficiency that causes some of these copper toxicity symptoms that we once heard about in school. That if somebody doesn't have enough ceruloplasmin to bind up copper so that copper can do all the good things it's supposed to do, maybe that is creating copper toxicity. Because I, I was asked uh, by somebody, you know, what does it mean if I have copper toxicity? I have high copper in a hair mineral analysis test that I did. I wonder about their ceruloplasmin levels and I wonder about their retinol or preformed vitamin A status, which we'll talk about. So ceruloplasmin's job is to keep iron moving cellular iron efflux. And it's one of the biggest proteins in the body. It contains 1,066 amino acids and six to eight copper enzymes. So iron is not meant to be stored. Circulating iron is the ideal state. Ceruloplasmin levels become elevated as an acute phase reactant in response to inflammation. So when we are inflamed, we make more ceruloplasmin to manage that inflammation. And uh, there must be optimal levels of copper and amino acids to make ceruloplasmin so that it can function. Now, it also helps the body fight infections. It's important for enabling neutrophils to function. And 95% of the copper in our body is supposed to be complex inside of ceruloplasmin. Now, it's also important to know that, you know, in, in endurance exercise, any sort of stress will deplete our minerals like magnesium and copper. And we're going to get into magnesium next. And this depletion sets the stage for an inflammatory response. So whenever we don't have enough uh, uh, copper, we can experience this rise in oxidative stress and we can start to experience more inflammation, more disease. And then we experience lower levels of magnesium and copper, and this can start to affect our heart health. So magnesium, we've talked about iron, we talked about copper, we're going to talk about magnesium. Without enough magnesium, cells simply don't work. And this is a quote by Lawrence M. Resnick, MD, professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medical School. If you suffer from fatigue, you likely suffer from a magnesium deficiency. There are magnesium binding sites on 3,751 human proteins. Most foods are woefully lacking in magnesium, so grain products that comprise a large part of our standard American diet are usually overloaded with iron, and lacking in magnesium is sort of the opposite of what our ancestors would have eaten. Magnesium activates metabolic pathways in the body, including those responsible for protein, carbohydrate, and fat metabolism. 
And it is involved in energy metabolism because it's essential for key steps of anaerobic glycolysis, remember turning glucose to pyruvate and the Krebs cycle, as well as stabilization of ATP. So ATP is actually magnesium ATP. There's one molecule of magnesium attached to every ATP to stabilize it. And therefore it's involved in the production and storage of energy inside each of our hundred trillion cells. And we generate our body weight in magnesium ATP every day. Magnesium is an essential nutrient for muscles, plays a vital role in their proper functioning and their um, relationship and their contraction. And then it gets them ready for the next contraction involves their muscle relaxation without magnesium. There'd be no regulation of movement and muscles couldn't function or operate. Magnesium is vital for proper heart function. It's recognized in the role of protecting against heart disease, heart attack, stroke, and hypertension, high blood pressure. In 2012, a meta-analysis found a statistically significant inverse association with magnesium intake and risk of stroke. And this was in a study with 241,000 participants. Patients with low magnesium levels have a higher risk of dying of heart disease Magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker, and it doesn't have any side effects of health risks. It prevents formation of blood clots. It regulates blood pressure. It protects against arterial spasms. Magnesium ATP is essential for protecting the heart because heart muscles contain very high concentrations of mitochondria, and they depend on ATP. Copper ensures that there is enough magnesium necessary for maintaining cardiovascular health. And it helps magnesium carry out its many other metabolic functions. Interestingly, every aspect of magnesium loss is caused by copper iron dysregulation in the endothelial layer of the arteries and heart muscles. So as we learned, a lack of copper and an increase in iron contributes to rising oxidative stress. This dysregulation and oxidative stress causes magnesium loss in those cells. This is the iron heart hypothesis by Jerome L. Sullivan, which was published in the Lancet in 1981. Therefore, he says, heart disease is caused by copper deficiency, which causes iron overload in the tissues of the heart and blood cells. Because remember that copper is needed to bring iron out of the tissues and put it in hemoglobin and red blood cells so it can, be, so it can carry oxygen throughout our body. Magnesium is most rapidly depleted during times of stress. It's called the magnesium burn rate or the MBR. All of the stressors we experience in our day-to-day -day lives become oxidative stress inside of our cells and oxidative stress is what depletes magnesium. Magnesium prevents, it provides us with calm energy. There's an inverse relationship between cortisol or stress hormone and magnesium. When our body's magnesium stores are low or depleted, cortisol levels spike upwards and stress makes the body more acidic. Magnesium is used to buffer that acidity, which in turn causes you to burn more magnesium. Low intracellular magnesium causes the release of more stress hormones. So there's, again, this vicious cycle that we see. You are stressed you are supposed to just, after the stressor is gone, go back to normal. But because the stress causes this depletion of magnesium, we're already low in magnesium and low magnesium triggers more stress response. You start to see a vicious cycle occur, a maintenance process, a biological maintenance process in the body. Now, when we're stressed, we also release free fatty acids as an energy source, and these bind to inactive magnesium in the bloodstream, and they slow down the transport of glucose and oxygen into muscles. They prevent magnesium from being used to make uh, ATP. And then we start to see fatigue, cellular oxygen deprivation, loss of glucose transport, cholesterol ratios get thrown out of balance, and then we start to hit a wall. And this might be the biochemical um, mechanism of burnout. Interestingly, we need magnesium to turn cortisone into cortisol and back to cortisone. So cortisol is our active stress hormone and cortisone is its sort of storage state hormone that is inactive. So when we are stressed, we, we take cortisone, we turn it into cortisol and magnesium is involved in this step because it's needed to, um, it's needed for a reaction that turns cortisone into cortisol. 
and then and then backwards and then back into cortisone. So once the stress is over, we're not able to turn the cortisol back into cortisone if we're still magnesium deficient. And so we end up with this chronic elevated stress via all these different rea- all these different interactions, right? So one of them is that like lipids bind to magnesium during stress. One is that magnesium is buffering acidity. Another one is that there's less magnesium that causes this dysregulation between copper and iron. And then another one is that we're not able to inactivate cortisol when the stress is over. Magnesium also regulates calcium homeostasis through three hormones, calcitonin, parathyroid hormone, and vitamin D or hormone D. And so it conducts the body's minerals. It's like the the conductor of the mineral orchestra, according to Morley Robbins. Any form of stress uh, burns magnesium. So it's called the magnesium burn rate. Under extreme stress, the body loses its ability to remineralize, causing oxidative stress and inflammation, magnesium deficiency, low magnesium in red blood cells, and inflammation, which further causes stress and magnesium depletion. When the body, interestingly, when the body is expressing high peroxidase activity, so this is the copper dependent enzyme that takes iron out of the tissues and puts them into the red blood cells, it minimizes the magnesium burn rate. So we see this connection between copper, iron, and magnesium. And so you see, you can't just, you know, biological reductionism supposes that just one thing is out of balance that we have to replace, right? We're, we have low iron. So in the blood, so we're going to put iron filings in the food. When in reality, we might have low iron in the blood because it's stuck in the tissues because of low copper, which is not allowing the, um, the, the, uh, the iron to get into the the body or get into the the blood and get into the red blood cells. And then this, this issue with peroxidase, this issue with iron recycling and is also impacting our magnesium levels. So the optimal dose of magnesium, if you're curious, is according to a woman called Mildred S. Selig, MD, is 10 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So a 200 pound um, or 200 or yeah, 200 pound persons, but 90 kilograms would take about a thousand milligrams of magnesium a day. Um, however, and this is from food and supplementation, not just from supplementation, but most people need to build up a bowel tolerance. And so I'll typically prescribe it to bowel tolerance. Um, if you want more information about that, then, uh, and you live in Ontario, consider booking an appointment and we'll talk about maximizing your magnesium. And if you need to supplement with it. So the body can't recognize ATP unless magnesium is attached to it. Magnesium is found within the mitochondrial matrix right alongside copper. And we talked about it maintains calcium homeostasis. Without magnesium, calcium becomes unregulated and unbalanced. And oxidative stress from iron accumulation can cause an increase of calcium into cells, which can hurt the mitochondria. Magnesium is needed for glycolysis, turning glucose into pyruvate. The Krebs cycle requires magnesium. And if magnesium is not available because of oxidative stress causing magnesium loss, pyruvate becomes lactic acid instead. And then we res- we end up going into anaerobic um, cellular respiration, and this makes very low energy. This is one of the proposed mechanisms in fibromyalgia. So Dr. Abraham, this fibromyalgia research, found that magnesium is essential for making energy. And that a lack of magnesium's ability to make energy or deficiency or dysfunction in the mitochondria may be contributing to fibromyalgia. So in other words, when experiencing fibromyalgia, considering this copper iron magnesium connection. And so to summarize this part of the podcast, copper, ceruloplasmin, and magnesium are essential for three stages of energy production, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electric transport chain. They are responsible for making energy and preventing the buildup of oxidative stress or exhaust. Now, it's also important to talk about vitamin A. So vitamin A or retinol is the animal-based form of vitamin A. 
It brings energy to the process that makes copper bioavailable. So it loads copper into ceruloplasmin. And it also supports the process of recycling iron for proper hemoglobin formation. There, there's a uh, case study. So a, a doctor, Theophilus Thompson, who was an, an MD in 1855, used cod liver oil, which contains no iron or copper, but it's a rich source of vitamin A. He used it to cure anemia, which is another clue, although this is published in 1855. It's another clue that anemia has way more uh, involved than just iron. So vitamin A is found in cod liver oil, beef liver, butter from grass-fed cows or other animal foods. It's not the same as beta carotene. This is retinol. So this is the real vitamin A, uh, not plant-based vitamin A. Vitamin A is only found in animal foods. It's vital for loading copper into ceruloplasmin so that it can regulate iron throughout the body and prevent it from causing inflammation and oxidative stress. Uh, Low-fat diets have reduced our levels of retinol or preformed vitamin A not to be confused with beta carotene again. And it is fat soluble and it's only found in animal source foods. And it plays an essential role in body growth, immune function, vision, and reproductive health. It's essential for the homeostasis of copper through interactions with human ATPases. So helps with um, regulating the you know, ATP. So ATP7A and ATP7B both require retinol to load copper into their copper pumps and control the production of a network of 12 copper-driven enzymes that regulate and run human metabolism or the production of energy in our cells. So we don't just need, it's not just about copper, but about copper, ceruloplasmin, and vitamin A. We need the copper to regulate iron. We need ceruloplasmin to bind the copper and control it and carry it around. And we need vitamin A to load the copper into the ceruloplasmin. I hope you're all with me so far. Mitochondrial dysfunction. So here's some problems that we see with these elements. So here are some dysfunctions. So one is mitochondrial dysfunction. A man called Denim Harmon, a PhD and an MD, he has something called the free radical theory of aging. The, the theory goes that mitochondria are damaged by free radicals and, product, and produce oxidative stress, and that affects our lifespan. However, mitochondrial dysfunction isn't a disease. In According to Morley Robbins and the research he shares, it's probably caused by mineral dysregulation, a lack of copper, a lack of magnesium and ceruloplasmin, and a buildup of iron that causes mito metabolic stress. And this only worsens as we age. So his idea is, as we age, we become more, we load more iron, we become more copper deficient. And so this, this discrepancy carries on as we age. And by age 40, we start to see this damage in the tissues, usually starts with poor eyesight, but it starts with like, the little aches and pains that start to develop, the low energy, the emergence of health conditions, and all of these kind of things. And this is a mineral, an issue with mineral dysregulation. So iron, we know, is toxic in high amounts and when it's unbound and unregulated. So healthy iron needs to be bound in hemoglobin or myoglobin and not stuck in our tissues. In order to be bound in hemoglobin and myoglobin, we need copper to direct it. Now, iron overload is, and there is a condition called hemochromatosis where somebody has, they just have a lot more iron. They need to get uh, almost weekly blood draws to lower their iron. Otherwise, it sets them up for a lot of conditions. But Symptoms of iron overload are abdominal pain, adrenal function problems, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, Parkinson's, other neurodegenerative diseases, like, you know, uh, any sort of cognitive diseases, amenorrhea or lack of periods, atherosclerosis or buildup of plaques in the arteries, arrhythmia, heart attack, autoimmune disorders, blood sugar dysregulation, cancer, chronic fatigue, depression, enlarged spleen, hair loss, hepatitis C, hypogonadism, hypopituitarianism. So these are like small gonads, small testes or ovaries. Hypopituitarianism is a small pituitary gland that regulates hormones in the body. Hypothyroidism, so 
function, like under functioning thyroid, impotence, infertility, low libido, loss of interest in sex, non alcoholic fatty liver disease is a very common one, cirrhosis of the liver, osteoporosis, osteopenia, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, joint pain, sarcopenia, so loss of muscle, skin color changes, type 1 diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. So pretty much every main condition that we see because this iron buildup in the tissues causes oxidative stress, causes rusting, causes damage to these tissues and causes them to malfunction. Let's talk about anemia. So according to Morley Robin, so what we know about anemia is a lack of red blood cells is diagnosed by low hemoglobin, low hematocrit and low red blood cells in a complete blood count or a blood test that looks at your red and white blood cells. So anemia, again, is low red blood cells, low hemoglobin, and low hematocrit. Anemia can be caused by lots of things. Nutritionally, we think it's a lack of iron, a lack of B12, and a lack possibly of vitamin B6. Um, we can also get anemia from blood loss, from chronic disease, from lead toxicity, uh, and so various other things like that. According to Morley Robbins, though, anemia is caused by excess iron, which causes copper to become less bioavailable and functional. And so when we were, told, we were diagnosed with anemia, we're told to increase iron in foods and supplements. But anemia is not necessarily iron deficiency, but iron dysfunction, which leads to chronic inflammation. And the real issue is lack of bioavailable copper. So we need copper to activate something called ferroportin, which exports iron from cells in our blood. And we also need copper for ferroxidase that makes iron into the active form. And that's derived from multi-copper oxidase enzymes. So iron is the most abundant element on earth. And so we're probably not deficient in iron. And I see this all the time. I see patients like they're told they have anemia. So they take iron and they take like 300 milligrams of ferrous fumarate or some heavy duty iron or even an iron based glycinate, like 35 milligrams of iron based glycinate a day. And, you know, just massive amounts of iron that sometimes don't reg increase their levels or their levels increase very, very slowly. And I never really understood why this was. I thought it was bowel absorption issues, or I thought that maybe bacteria in the gut were stealing the iron. But there is this other pathway that this lack of copper or this lack, you know, so lack of ceruloplasmin, lack of ferroxidase enzyme expression leads to this issue with iron recycling. And so it's not anemia of iron deficiency, it's actually anemia of bioavailable copper. We are eating iron-rich foods, we're taking iron supplements, and we're constantly exposed to iron. It's the most abundant chemical on earth. In 1934, three physicians won the Nobel Prize for curing anemia and pernicious anemia, which is a lack of B12. And they were named Dr. Whipple, Minot, and Murphy. They won the um, Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. And they cured anemia with beef liver. So interestingly, twice as there's twice as much copper as there is iron in healthy beef liver from grass-fed cows. Liver is also the main storage site for both retinol and copper. And so it's very possible and that iron alone does not cure anemia. Copper, becoming catalyzed by retinol, vitamin A, becomes bioavailable that allows iron to be functional inside the body. If someone is anemic, it means that there's not enough iron in the blood, but it's probably more likely due to lack of bioavailable copper. The iron is not attached to hemoglobin where it belongs. And so it's unable to be used by the reticular, the reticular endothelial system, the RES, uh, to bring it to the bone marrow, where it's then incorporated into red blood cells and heme. And we make two to three million red blood cell precursor cells every second in our bone marrow. But copper is needed for this, for this to happen. So 
there's many different mechanisms that that low iron could contribute to anemia but the but the basic premise is that we need iron or we need copper to make sure that iron is following its proper pathway so there's three steps that involve making you know iron sulfur clusters and heme and energy we need copper for all these steps we need uh, lots of magnesium and red blood cells in order to make energy so that red blood cells can live a full life. And that's where we find most of our iron. So magnesium is important as well for anemia because magnesium protects red blood cells and helps them make energy. We need copper for SOD1 and SOD3. So these are antioxidant enzymes that mop up free radicals and these protect our red blood cells. Um, anemia can occur because iron is trapped in the gut and it can't be delivered to the bloodstream. So first iron needs to get into the enterocytes, so into the gut cells, and this happens pretty well. And then we need to move the iron from the gut cells into the bloodstream. And in order to do this, it needs to pass through the ferroportin doorway, which requires bioavailable copper expressing ferroxidase. And this occurs in, in cerebral plasmin. And that means needs to be, we need to put the iron in something called transferrin, just sort of like the little car that takes it around and then transport it to the bone marrow and then get it to help form blood. And these are also important, cerebral plasmin transferrin, to keep iron bound so that bacteria and pathogens can't grab it and make it into their own replication machinery. Um, we also need... Um, it to deliver iron to the spleen. We need um you know, we need you know copper for red blood's homeostasis and iron recycling. And therefore anemia, you know, is likely not a uh a an issue with copper or uh, iron, but low copper. So interestingly, I'm we'll just talking about cholesterol really quickly. It, there's this connection with cholesterol and oxidative stress as well. So cholesterol appeared around the time of the great oxygen event on earth, and it takes up 11 molecules of oxygen to make a molecule of cholesterol. So it's kind of like an oxygen sink, especially if you don't have enough copper to activate oxygen to make energy or magnesium ATP in the mitochondria or deactivate oxidants that prevent oxidative stress. Cholesterol acts as a governor to regulate how much oxygen passes through cell membranes into the cells. And we notice an increase in cholesterol as a result of oxidative stress. So oxygen rusts cholesterol. Cholesterol sort of sacrifices itself for this rusting and soaks up excess oxygen. Oxygen. So in the 1950s, we were told to reduce cholesterol in the diet and, and reduce fat. And this gave rise to the cholesterol myth. myth that cholesterol is a risk factor for heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, and other cardiovascular conditions. And we're prescribed cholesterol-lowering drugs that are today the most widely prescribed class of medications. These are statins like um, Crestor and Lipitor. Um, our liver produces about 1,000 milligrams of cholesterol every day, however. And when people eliminate or restrict our intake of cholesterol-rich foods we increase our liver production of cholesterol by, by an additional 500 milligrams a day. And just for reference, an egg is about 180 milligrams of cholesterol. So you restrict your cholesterol intake and your body just makes more. Cholesterol is important for our cell membranes, which enclose and protect our cells. It's important for a normal functioning nervous system. It plays an important role in the developmental stage and mature um mature adulthood of the brain. It's needed by the body to manufacture hormones, fat soluble vitamins, steroid hormones, and bile salts required to absorb our fats. And it's very anti-inflammatory. So cholesterol levels rise in response to inflammation in the body as the body attempts to cope with this inflammation. Iron causes low density lipoprotein or LDL, one, one type of cholesterol to become rusty and leads to the buildup of coronary plaques. Therefore, there's this iron connection that causes heart disease, and it's not just about cholesterol. In fact, cholesterol is an oxygen sink that evolved alongside oxygen's appearance on the planet. 
and it rises in the presence of oxidative stress or in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, very reactive chemical. And when copper is biounavailable, so if we are deficient in copper, we experience this rise in cholesterol because iron is now unbound and wrecking havoc in the tissues. And so one of the hypotheses is that when somebody has high cholesterol in blood, this may indicate a copper deficiency because we're seeing this rise in the body making more cholesterol in response to this oxidative stress. So there's too much iron, not enough copper. And so if somebody has anemia or low iron, low red blood cells, low neutrophils, high cholesterol, we really have to look at copper status. And copper is something that you can measure in the blood, but I wouldn't rely too heavily on it because it's not going to tell us, you know, copper serum levels are not going to tell us what's available within the cells and what's in the mitochondria. And this is the same problem we run into with magnesium because we can't blood magnesium levels are not going to tell us what's available in our tissues. So why do we see these deficiencies? So our soil no longer contains the minerals it used to. NPK or nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, or sorry, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, crop fertilizer blocks the uptake of copper by food crops. There's a relationship between soil, grass, and cows on the farm. And, and this is work by a man called Andre, Andre Voisson, P, Voisson, PhD. And he found that, um, that, that this, there was this copper relationship and that the healthier the soil, the healthier the grass, the healthier the cows, the healthier the people. There was this relationship, you know, within our, the ecosystem of the farm. Antibiotics ruin the microbes in the soil, especially magnesium and copper, and they deplete those minerals. Food is far less nutritious than the, the food grown by our ancestors, and the minerals and microbes in our soil are depleted. Plus, we add Roundup, or glyphosate, which chelates and removes minerals from the soil, especially copper. Um, now, glyphosate also affects the production of ceruloplasmin plasmin in our bodies um kind of it looks a little bit like a um an amino acid called glycine which you can get in magnesium glycinate uh or collagen supplements and so it pulls glycine out of our ceruloplasmin so we get this wonky ceruloplasmin containing glyphosate instead and so we end up with the dysfunctional ceruloplasmin so we're not able to inactivate the antioxidants in our body or inactivate the oxidants in our body, the oxygen in our body, and and no and we're not able to regulate iron. And Stephanie Seneff, PhD, is the one behind this research. Now we overuse glyphosate like mad. We use it four times every growing season, and it's used as a desiccant to accelerate the drying out process of wheat. Um, and there are some theories that glyphosate residue on wheat rather than gluten is responsible for the non-celiac gluten sensitivity that we see. Wheat is also far less nutritionally dense than that consumed by our ancestors. and But even organic farming still grows in the same soil, and it takes many, many generations before we can replenish the soil. There's been an 80% loss of copper in crop soil over the past 80 years, according to Ben Edwards, MD. And this is a this is a probably one of the greatest tragedies of our time is what's happening to the topsoil. And um, there's there's two meters of topsoil that has been ripped up and um, and ruined essentially by um, by these you know we we've ripped up these perennial grasses that ruminants like cows would graze on that would protect our topsoil. And, you know, the hooves of the cows and their manure would nourish the soil. And all that's ripped up in favor of mono cropping agriculture to produce corn, soy and wheat um, to feed cows and feedlots when they could be just living on the land. And, uh, you know, it's very sad. And then we are spraying these crops with glyphosate with Roundup, which is further depleting the soil and creating and, and creating toxicity in our bodies. We're also nutrient deficient because of refining. So refining nutrients strips the nutrient refining foods strips the nutrients out of the food. 
And then we add sugars back in because the food ends up being tasteless. Um, there's a researcher, Mara Fields, who's a PhD, and she hypothesizes that increasing dietary sugar has a negative effect on copper and magnesium status. And finally, stress. Stress outside of our body becomes oxidative stress inside of our cells. Carl Ludwig Alfred Fielder, medical doctor, in 1899 found that stress causes magnesium loss. Magnesium loss causes electrolyte loss, and electrolyte loss causes energy loss, and energy loss causes cell death. And cell death triggers natural bodily inflammation to clear dead tissue. Inflammation causes calcification, fibrosis, and so on and so on. So there's these chronic conditions that arise from stress. Um, now, it, stress can also reduce AD, ATP production by 40 to 95 times. And so what did we learn? We learned that, you know, iron is a very reactive chemical. It reacts with oxygen in the body. We need oxygen to create energy, but oxygen is also very reactive. And so oxygen needs to be shuttled. So it's carried around by iron, but it needs to be shuttled around very carefully by the body. So iron needs to be lodged in hemoglobin, not in our tissues where it can carry oxygen safely throughout the body. And then that oxygen needs to be harnessed by healthy mitochondria that use copper dependent enzymes in the electron transport chain to, to uh, create ATP or energy for our cells. And this step also involves magnesium because ATP is bound to magnesium to stabilize it. An overload of iron in our tissues may not reflect in our blood. And this may be caused by a lack of copper to regulate the iron in the body and possibly a lack of vitamin A to help the copper regulate the iron. <laughs> it's like that nursery rhyme, like the, the farmer takes a cow and the cow takes a wife or whatever, however that song goes. <laughs> it's like, so we have, and this is sort of the thing with our body. It's like, I hope that what you get from this is that it's a complex process of mineral regulation or to make energy. And it's fascinating to me because I never would have thought of copper as the main player in this in this creation of energy for our bodies. And so what do we go from here? Well, one thing I'm going to offer you, I'm not going to give any recommendations on this podcast, but one of the key components of my practice these days is beef liver. I firmly believe that beef liver will probably be abundant in every health food store. There's already many desiccated, so dehydrated and chopped up capsule, capsulated beef liver supplements on the market. Um, you know, for people that don't like the idea of consuming liver, such as myself, but beef liver is the richest source of bioavailable copper. And there's a two to one copper to iron ratio. So you get iron from beef liver, but you also get, bi you also get bioavailable copper. You also in beef liver get choline, which is important for cell membranes and liver function. You get retinol, which helps load copper into ceruloplasm. You get hyaluronic acid, which is good for this. It helps hydrate our skin and our joints. You get B vitamins such as folate and B12, which is why beef liver um, was the, was the, you know, three scientists won the Nobel prize in 1934 for using beef liver to kill both or cure both anemia and pernicious anemia or B12 deficiency anemia. Beef liver also has vitamin C. The idea too that I am drawn to these days is that the beef liver contains these nutrients in bioavailable forms, which means that our body recognizes these nutrients. So folate is in beef liver versus folic acid, which is used to supplement our food that we might not recognize. Heme iron is in beef liver versus the iron filings that are added to our food. We, you know, choline, retinol, so preformed vitamin A versus beta carotene. So we have these bioavailable um, nutrients in a ratio that makes sense in nature and in our bodies. And so it's interesting that in 1934, these three scientists were, were awarded the Nobel Prize for using, using beef liver to cure anemia. And then we went on this tangent of 
using ferrous fumarate or even like vegan iron supplements or and I very often use iron bisglycinate vitamin C to try and help pe- my patients with anemia or iron deficiency when really all along it was like you tap your glass slippers and here you are you could always go back home anytime but you had to what was the final line in the wizard of oz it's like she had to want to or she had to be- she wouldn't have believed it <laughs> it's kind of like that so in the end, I feel like there's a lot of magic in our natural world. This is a very naturalist view. I understand, but I'm a naturopathic doctor, so I, I can kind of get away with it, I hope. Um, that nature's is wise and intelligent. And so I am moving away from this biological reductionist mindset to what are why is someone experiencing these issues what deficiency or excess may be present what are some of these network connections like this complex relationship between copper vitamin a magnesium iron our mitochondria you know how how what story can we tell that may be at the deep root of what someone is experiencing so somebody with fatigue you know, what is their copper status? What is their iron status? Is iron available to their tissues? How much magnesium do they have? Are they experiencing stress and burning through magnesium? Is the stress caused by lack of iron and excess uh, and or lack of uh, copper and excess iron or lack of vitamin A? And then we start to find, well, beef liver, <laughs> you know, are they eating beef liver? Probably not. And therefore, let's try this as, as one of our interventions or as one of our suggestions. And so beef liver, you can get in capsules um, or you can eat it, uh, you know, organic grass fed beef liver. These are the, this is the form with, with bioavailable nutrients, uh, four to six ounces once a week or one ounce a day, which usually equates to four to six capsules of a desiccated beef liver every day. Uh, personally, I will say I have really pared down my supplements and right now I just take beef liver, magnesium before bed, cod liver oil, which has an A, a favorable vitamin A to D ratio and omegas. Um, and then I take a vitamin E supplement. That's it. Four nutritional supplements, most of them from Whole Foods, and then herbs as needed uh, for specific things, because herbs, I think, are also very intelligent in terms of our network pathways. Um and then lots of manual therapies, exercise, lots of lifestyle things. So my supplement list has drastically been reduced from what I was taking before, which was B vitamins and zinc. And then I would have to add this other thing because one thing depletes the other thing. And then if you're adding this, you've got to be mindful of this. And you start getting into a, a head spin with all of these different factors to consider it's possible that nature knows more than we could ever understand because nature exists in these complex webs and networks that our minds, which are have been trained to be quite linear, can't quite grasp. Um, and so I'll leave you with that is one of the things you might consider doing is check out my course, um, Feed Your Head, which is a, it talks about mental health and nutrition and I do have a, uh, like I do discuss supplements, uh, whole food supplements and, um, and what benefit they may have for our brain and our mental health. And so you might want to check that course out at learn.goodmoodproject.ca. Let me know what you thought of this podcast. I know this is complicated stuff. It's different from what I usually do. Um, for me, this stuff was mind blowing. Like this really helped me understand, uh, some things, some, some holes that I felt were missing. Why weren't people getting better with iron supplementation? Why wasn't it helping? Why are people chronically deficient in iron when iron is so abundant on the planet and there's so much of it in our food supply? What is triggering autoimmune disease, chronic disease, chronic stress and inflammation? And, you know, and, and, and how do we support it? And why does beef liver just feel so right? <laughs> So this is the Good Mood Podcast. My name is Dr. Tali Mercajani. Let me know what you thought of that episode and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.